Deuce is also the founder of the Photoshop Training Channel, one of the most popular Photoshop YouTube channels in the world. Tutorials have been featured on many of the most well-known photography and design-related websites. Today, Jesus is here to give share, us, share with us some of his favorite Photoshop tips and tricks. Let us all welcome Jesus. Thanks again for being here. Hey, Andrew. Thanks for having me. And uh, thank you, everybody, for being here on a Saturday or Sunday for some of you. I, I was looking at the chat window, and I know we have people from all over the world. So if, if you guys want to just type where you're from, go right ahead. I'm currently in Alameda, California, which is in the San Francisco Bay Area. And I believe, Andrew, you're in Beverly Hills, California? Right. All right. And uh, Kathy and Damon, I'm not sure where you guys are at, but we got... Uh, Kathy's in uh, Bakersfield area, I believe. Bakersfield, um, California? India. Nice. It's an extremely yeah. international group today. It's quite... You got Canada, Germany, India, Boston, Santa Rosa, Florida... I think we saw Sweden earlier. Awesome. Yeah, so as Andrew mentioned, what, what I'm going to talk about today are just a whole bunch of different Photoshop tips and tricks, and they're not going to be in any particular order. And I got the idea for this presentation out of a video that I did maybe two months ago, which turned out to be one of my most popular videos on YouTube, and it went viral. And it was simply called Five Photoshop Tricks That You Probably Don't Know. And if you look at the comments, most people only knew one. Some people didn't know any. So I decided to think about all the different Photoshop tips and tricks that I knew that were similar to that video and come up with like a one hour presentation with similar tips and tricks. So if you saw that video, then I hope you enjoy this presentation because it will be along the same lines. As I mentioned earlier, they're in no particular order. So I'm just going to start out by showing you different techniques tricks shortcuts things like that if you have any questions you can type them in the chat window i won't be able to read it as i'm working but if uh if it's a question that andrew can answer he'll answer it if not andrew will interrupt me and i will try to answer your question so feel free to type any questions you have so i'm currently working in the latest version of photoshop but the majority of things that i'm going to show will work on older versions of photoshop so you don't need to have the latest and greatest version if you have an older version like CS6 or anything like that, you should be fine. Okay, so the first thing I'm going to show show is something very uh, export zoomify it's going to bring up this window you can select where you want to save the file it's going to be an html file actually multiple files but the file we're going to be looking at through the browser is going to be an html file you can click on the older button to select the destination of your file the quality of the file and the width height and then you can decide to open in browser as soon as the file is created which is what i'm going to do then I'm going to press OK. Photoshop is going to take a minute and it's going to open up a browser. And actually, I just thought about something. Um, I'm not sure if my browser is being shared. Um, Andrew, can you can you tell me if you can see the browser? Because I don't think you can. Uh, it's kind of like a, uh, once again, that pattern, the blue lines and white lines. Oh, here we go. I can see it now. You can see it now. Okay. Chrome, right? 
Firefox actually, but yeah. So this window, as you can see, is a HTML file. So you can put that on your website. Photoshop created that automatically. I can click on this plus sign to zoom in and you can see the details of that high resolution image. I can zoom out and I can move it around. I can also click on this um, box here and move the box around. So as you can see, Photoshop created that automatically. And then something you may want to do is take your HTML file and maybe put it on your server somewhere and then display it online. Go back into Photoshop. Nice. <clears throat> That's cool. I didn't, I didn't even know you could do that. So actually, I'm learning already. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, and by the way, guys, um, this is being recorded. So if you're taking notes and I'm going a little fast, don't worry. You can always come back and rewatch the video. All right. So that was a Sumify script. And once again, that's in the export menu here at the bottom. Sumify. The next thing I want to show is how to open up a flattened version of a Photoshop file with many, many layers. So sometimes you may be working on a file and it has a ton of layers, maybe thousands of layers, and it takes a while to open. The files are big and it takes your computer some time to open, but maybe you don't want to actually work on the file. Maybe you just want to show the file to a client, or maybe you just want to save a flattened version so you can share it on Facebook or any other social media. So one way of just opening a flattened version of a file with multiple layers is by using a keyboard shortcut. But before I show you what that shortcut is, I'm just going to go to File, Open, and I'm going to open this file called Winter Soldier. Oh, and actually, a little side note, um, you can see the Sumify folder here in the files that were created um, with that Sumify uh, script we ran earlier. So it creates all these other files. But anyway, back to the opening up a flat version of a file with multiple layers. First, I'm just going to open up the file normally so you can see what the file normally looks like. And it's, it's not going to take too long to open, but you saw, uh, actually, I don't know if you can see it through the Connect software, but there was like a spinning icon and it took a little bit to open. It's not a giant file. Um, I didn't want to open up a giant file in this presentation just because I didn't want this the computer to crash or have any problems with Connect. However, this file does have a lot of layers, as you can see here on the right. Now, if this were a bigger file, it may take longer to open and you may not want to wait for it. And there is just no need of opening up a, a big file with all these layers. If all you want to do is show it to somebody or just do a quick save as and save it as a JPEG for social media. So one thing that you can do is go to file, open, and you can hold the shift key and the alt key. That's shift option in the Mac. And then you can click on open. Uh, sorry about that. Select the file. Uh, select the file by holding uh, Shift Alt selected, and then click on open. And Photoshop is going to ask you if you want to read the composite data instead. Meaning, do you want to open up a flattened version of this file? If you press OK, Photoshop opens up this file really, really quickly. As you saw, I didn't get any. I didn't get that uh, icon telling me the file was loading. And notice that it's now just a flattened version. So from this point, I can go in and save it. Um, save it for the web or, you know, save, save, do a save as, for example, or do anything like that. So I can share this file uh, with somebody, or maybe I'm just showing it to a client and I want it to open up quickly. I don't want to deal with any of the layers and I'm just showing them the flat version of this file. Now you have to be very, very careful because if I decide to actually do some work and I create a new layer and maybe paint on it and then uh, close it and save it, this will override the file. So you will lose all your layers. So you have to be very, very careful when you do this technique because if I click on save um, and I try to open this file again, notice that my work has been lost. So be very, very careful when you use this uh, shortcut. Um, the next thing I'm going to talk about is sometimes you may want to keep a history log of the steps that you've taken while working with a file almost like a tutorial in a way, almost like a written tutorial and, and, and to a certain degree. And what that means is that I can actually export a file, a text file that contains all the steps that I've done to a file. So maybe I'm working on this image here and I apply certain filters and maybe certain adjustments. And I want to know exactly what those were, but I forgot because it's been maybe a day, two days, a week, a month, or whatever. But if you want to keep a history of the steps that you've done to a certain file, you can enable Photoshop to keep track of those steps. So I'm just going to undo those changes. 
and I'm going to go into the preferences. So I'm going to press Control A, that's Command K on the Mac to bring up the preferences. And under History Log, tab on the left side, I can check this box and I can keep a text file and I can choose where this text file will be. So I'll just call it Photoshop Edit Log and I'll add the word tips just so I know that it was um, for the tips presentation. I'll click on save and press OK. Now if I do those uh, adjustments again Photoshop is going to record them. So blur, Gaussian blur I think we did and then we did a curve adjustment and this time maybe we'll do another adjustment, maybe another filter maybe I don't know. Yeah, just so. Okay, so I know that doesn't look too good, but that's not the point. The point is the file that is being created. I'm gonna go and disable that file, uh, that setting now. So press Control K, Command K, Command. Go back into History Log, uncheck this, press OK. Now I'm gonna open up that file, and again, I may have problems sharing it on screen, but I'll figure it out. Don't worry about that. Um, let me just go ahead and open up that file. I'm going into my folder here, and I'm pretty sure you can't see it, right, Andrew? It's not, it's not showing on screen. You have that uh, mesh thing again. Okay. So then uh, you can see this, right? So Photoshop created uh, this file, and it contains the adjustments that I made: Gaussian blur, what their radius was, curves, and the pinch filter. So Photoshop can keep a log of all the adjustments it makes to an image in case you ever want to go back and figure out what you did. So that's what the history log and I'm actually gonna bring this down. Okay, another thing that Photoshop can support for you that you might find very useful are keyboard shortcuts. So if I press Control Alt Shift K, Command Option Shift K on the Mac, you will get the keyboard shortcut menu. This allows you to edit your keyboard shortcuts if you wanted to or apply keyboard shortcuts to things that don't have keyboard shortcuts. Applied. But anyway, the one thing that you can do here that's really cool is click on the summarize button and it's going to create an HTML file that contains whatever keyboard shortcuts you have. In this case, default keyboard shortcuts since I don't have any custom keyboard shortcuts applied to this installation of Photoshop. So I'm just going to just call it Photoshop default key and it's going to come up and I'm pretty sure you're getting that, you're getting that weird screen right, Andrew, but I know how to bring it up. Yeah, here you go. So then, this is the export that I just did, the Photoshop default key file that I created. It's an HTM file. And as you can see, you have the keyboard shortcut for the items that have a keyboard shortcut applied to them. So you can print this out if you want to, and then you'll know the keyboard shortcuts that are assigned to the different tools and menus. So I'm going to get to this. Anne Marie uh, Concepcion, she says. When you come back, you stop sharing, and then you would just share your desktop instead of just one app, and that takes take care of that mesh pattern thing. Perfect. Thanks, Anne-Marie. And actually, I think that was the last time that I'm going to go out of Photoshop, but thanks. If, if for whatever reason I leave the Photoshop app and go somewhere else, I'll do that when I come back. Thanks, Anne-Marie. Okay. So now we're going to talk about a different tool that it's that might be helpful to a lot of people, um, especially once you have friends and family that figure out that you know how to do Photoshop and they want you to work on their family photos. And one of the things that this is actually uh, photos of my wife, uh, Michelle, which uh, is the little girl here, the little girl in the video in the photos and her twin brothers. And um, we got a whole bunch of family photos and there were kids. And from her dad, who is uh, Ellen standing there behind the horse. And it could be a really daunting task of just scanning one picture at a time, cropping it, and straining it. But with Photoshop, you can scan multiple images uh, onto one file and, and have Photoshop do all the cropping and straining for you. So we have this scan. This is an actual scan of three photographs. And to automatically crop and strain those photos, I'm going to go into File. Automate, crop, and straighten photos. Then Photoshop is going to crop, straighten those photos, and then create different files for each photo. So this is one file here, another there, and this one here. At this point, you can decide to maybe 
do an image rotation just so the photograph is facing the right way and then you can save these files on your computer. So that's one quick way of taking your family photos and digitizing them. Now I'm going to close all these files and I'm going to work only with one file, which is this one here. And I'm going to start with this folder here on top. It's called color match. And I'm going to be working with this image here. And for those of you that follow me, you might recognize this photograph. I created a tutorial called uh, cinematic color grading, where I show it how to use the curves adjustment layer to apply cinematic effects to a photograph. And it's a really good technique and it's really good for you to understand how curves work. Sometimes you don't have that kind of time and you just want to match a specific look right away. So maybe I want to match the matrix look. This is a screenshot from a YouTube video. Um, and I want to match that look onto this image. And one of the quickest and fastest ways of doing it is by using the color match uh, option in Photoshop. And the way that works is you select the layer that you want to apply the color match to and go to image, adjustment, match color. Then you select the source, in this case, the tips presentation file.psd. Then you select the layer that you want to reference. So in this case, the matrix layer. And right away, this layer takes the colors of the matrix layer. And you can play with the luminance values to make better adjustments, the color intensity, and you can fade it to zero if you wanted to, or anywhere in between. And I'm just going to press OK. So that is one way in which you can match the colors of an image. This technique is actually uh, good as well if you have, if you're making a composite and you have two different images with two different color tones. And if I were to mask out the background, now this character sort of seems like he's in the Matrix uh, movie and it looks a little bit more realistic simply because we match the colors. Now, if you get to advise that this color matching doesn't always work, uh, try it and see how it works with your images. So the luminance values of both images have to be similar in order for them to, to work. And uh, actually, you know what? Let me just undo this. If you guys are interested, um, I, was, I wasn't really planning on showing this, but if you guys are really interested on um, figuring out how to do that with the curves adjustment layer, I recommend that you learn it. It's a very valuable skill to have. I have a video on that on my uh, YouTube channel, and I'll quickly go through the steps. Um, essentially, you create a curves adjustment layer, and you have to use the red, green, and blue channels to achieve that effect. If you drag the curve up, you add light, in this case, red light, and if you drag the points down, you take away light in the opposite color, in this case, cyan. So essentially, you have to add cyan, um, add some green, and add some blue, and then play with the um, contrast of the image. And then you can come back into the different channels until you find the right shade of blue or green uh, that you're going for. So it's a 30 minute tutorial on doing color grading using the curves adjustment. So check it out on my website, photoshoptrainingchannel.com. Okay, so now we're gonna move on to the to the next Photoshop trick. And that one will be one that I used in my video, five Photoshop tricks that you probably didn't know. And this is one that a lot of people like. So essentially, when you're working in Photoshop, you can open two windows that have the same file and it makes it easier for you to make certain adjustments. So let me first show you how to open up the same window in two, or excuse me, the same file in two windows. So I'm going to be using this Italian castle and I'm going to go into window, range, new window four. And this is the file that I'm working with. It's presentation file.tv and that created a new window. With that is then I can go into window, range, two up vertical or two up horizontal. I'm going to choose two up vertical. And now I have the two files, or actually the two windows, same file, side by side. Then I can zoom in on one. So maybe I'm going to do my work on this one. Maybe I want to remove the curve. So I'm going to zoom in. 
And on this side here, I just want to see what the file looks at 100%. So I'm just going to double click on the zoom tool. Oops, sorry. I had the wrong window. Yeah. 100% here. And on this one, I'm just going to zoom in really, really close. Then in a blank layer, I'm going to use the clone stamp tool. And I'm going to sample from all layers. And I'm just going to try to clone these people out. So I'm going to... I'm going to zoom in. Excuse me, I'm going to hold Alt to find a spot to uh, find a source. And then I'm going to start painting away those turrets. Notice that if I'm painting the turrets away on this window, on the window on the left, the changes are applied on the fly. So I could see how my adjustments are going to look at 100%. So I don't have to zoom in and then zoom out just to get an idea of what the effect is looking like. So this really helps you out when you're making fine details and also you want to know what it looks like on the entire image. And you, you're not stuck with just two windows. You can do a third window if you wanted to. You can go into Window, Arrange, New Window 4, and now we have it. We have a tab on this window, but I can go into Window, Arrange, three up vertical so now i can have three different zoom levels and work on this image and then i can see how this works on three different zoom levels and go back and, and continue cleaning that out notice how the changes are automatically applied on the window on the left and the window on the right also if i if, uh, you probably know that by holding the space bar you can zoom on the window you hold shift and space bar and all of the windows at the same time. So you can move around the three windows all at the same time just by holding shift as you use the space bar. Let me go ahead and close two of these windows and work on the next uh, tip. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to show you how to use the black and white adjustment layer to control the luminous values of different colors. So we have this photograph uh, here of Florence. And I'm going to create a new black and white adjustment layer. This adjustment layer here. And what this layer does is it turns everything black and white. And then you can move these sliders around to either lighten up or darken the colors of the slider that I'm working with. In this case, the red slider. Make it really darker, or I can make them, make them brighter. But you can actually use these sliders to control color to change the blend mode. If we change the blend mode from normal to luminosity, the color stays, but now we're only controlling the luminance value. So notice what happens here. I'm making the reds darker, or I can make the reds brighter. And I can do this with yellows, greens, cyans, blues, and magentas. And we also have a layer mask. So maybe if we want to work in the sky, I can make a selection. And actually, I'll delete it now. And then I have no layer mask, but I have the selection. And if I create a new layer mask by clicking on the layer mask icon, then it automatically creates a layer mask out of that, uh, based on that selection. So I'm only going to affect the sky now. So if I make adjustments, I'm only affecting the sky. And if I want to maybe adjust the water, I can duplicate this layer. I can then drag it over into the new layer icon, or you can press Control J, Command J on the Mac. And you can invert this layer mask. So Control I, Command I to invert. And now I can control the water. And actually, since this is a uh, Photoshop tips uh, presentation, I'm going to show you another cool quick tip that I just thought about. I'm going to delete this layer mask. And Jesus? you may... Yeah. A couple people, uh, at least one person is asking if you could repeat that tip. Sure, sure. I'll finish what I was talking about, then I'll, I'll do it all over again. So this layer controls the sky. Now I created an adjustment layer to control the water, but I deleted the layer mask. And what I was going to show was that... I can duplicate the layer mask by holding Alt, Option, the Mac, and it duplicates the layer. But we still have the same problem. We have the sky selected and not the water. But if you throw in a keyboard shortcut there, you can duplicate the layer and make the inversion at the same time. So the shortcut is Alt, Shift, Option, Shift on the Mac. Notice the difference of the layer mask. I'll do that again. I'll delete the layer, 
If I hold Alt, Option on the Mac, and Shift, click and drag that layer, it duplicates it, and it inverts it at the same time. So that's what that does. So now with one layer, I can control the water, uh, or the bottom of the image at least, and then with the other layer, I can control the sky or the top of the image. Now let me just do this all over again really quickly. Um, it seems that some people might have missed it, and that's okay. Yeah. Um, if you don't want to repeat it, people are making a good point in the chat saying it is being recorded, so she can watch it again well, on her own time. You want to just move okay. on? Well, yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna move on, but um, I'm also gonna repeat it in a different way since that was still part of that presentation. But yeah, thanks. So Thank um, yeah, no worries. So a lot of people like this technique, but they've actually have seen it in the past. They just don't remember just because the other interface is so confusing, but it's really the same thing. So I'm just going to um, go through a better way of doing this. It may be a little more confusing, but I, at the end, I think you get better results. So what I just showed is using the black and white adjustment layer, setting it to luminosity and controlling the colors, uh, controlling the luminance values of the colors using this adjustment layer. That's what we just saw. Now, there's another way of doing it that I personally like best. It's a little more confusing for some people, but I think you get better results. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to click on the Florence layer so it's active. Then I'm going to convert it to a smart object. Converting things to a smart object allows you to apply different filters and effects and makes them editable. So they're non-destructive. Then I'm going to go into Filter, Camera, Raw, Filter. In the Camera Raw Filter, I have this icon right here that I'm going to click on. HSL grayscale. Notice the three tabs, hue, saturation, and luminance. So from this window, I can make the same adjustments as I was doing before without the adjustment layer. The added value of doing this is now that I, now I also have control of the exposure, contrast, highlights, shadows, all kinds of things just from this one window. And I know it can be a little bit more confusing because there's a, a whole bunch more um, sliders and tabs that you can click on. But if you're familiar with Camera Raw, just know that that last tip I showed you with the black and white adjustment layer, it's essentially using the luminance tab on the HSL grayscale uh, tab. And let's just say that I'm happy with the changes I made. And I know the image doesn't look great and um, that's not really, I'm not really concerned about the workflow. I'm, I'm more concerned about the actual tips here. So I'm just going to press OK. Now, notice what happens here. I get a layer mask. So I can still do what I was doing before. I can paint out the areas with black that I don't want the filter affecting. I can also double click on the camera raw filter label here, which brings up camera raw again. And I can continue making adjustments if I'm not happy with them. And I can also click on this icon here, which brings up the blending up. And I can bring down the opacity, or I can even change the blend mode to something else if I choose to. So this is just the more advanced version of using the black and white adjustment layer to control the luminance values of the people. Now I'm going to talk about uh, using the blend diff sliders. And a lot of people either don't know about the blend diff sliders, and if they do, they only use the RGB blend diff sliders. They don't necessarily use one channel at a time, and using one channel at a time can have a lot of benefits. So in this section, I'm going to show you how to replace the sky and add these clouds onto this image here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to double click on the side of the layer to, bl uh, to bring up the layer style window here. And I can use the blended slider to reveal the things in the back. So I'm going to go into the blue channel and I'm telling Photoshop to use the underlying layer as the layer to hide pixels from. So notice that if I'm clicking and dragging on this slider, hiding everything that's not blue, or better yet, any anything that let me, let me just cancel this. If, you, if I go into the channels uh, panel here, let me show this layer. If I go into the channels uh, panel. You can see what the blue panel looks like. So essentially, anything that's white up here, I'm sort of keeping. And if I come back here. Um, using the blend of slider, blue channel, underlying layer, so I'm hiding all, everything that doesn't really have blue in it, which of course the street doesn't have it and the buildings, but the sky does, so that's staying. And when, to, when I get to a certain point, things are going to get too uh, jaggy and I'm going to start uh, erasing part of the sky here. 
So what I can do is I can hold Alt, Option, and the Mac to split these two points in half, and now I can have a smoother transition. Notice the transition up here. And maybe I can keep pulling this one further to the right as far as I can, and maybe somewhere there. Now I can also use the red channel and do the opposite. I want these buildings to come through and hide the sky. So there's some orange here, so I know there's some red. So I can click and drag this over to the left. And like, the same thing starts happening as we're getting rid of the sky up here. So I can hold Alt, Option on the Mac, split those in half, and create a smoother transition. So that sky replacement became really easy to do by using the blend of sliders with the different channels. You just have to remember um, how colors are created. There's some red in the orange. There's obviously some blue in the sky. There's also cyan, of course. Um, it all depends on the image. So using the blend of sliders can allow you to create very complex selections really quickly. Another thing that you can do is maybe when you're done, you still see some of the sky, for example, here on the sign, then create what I like to call a garbage mask. mask. So I can click on the lasso tool and then just make a very rough selection here at the bottom. It doesn't have to be perfect. And with that selection, I can hold Alt, Option, and the Mac, click on the layer mask icon, and everything that I selected is black. I'm going to hold uh, Alt, Option, and the Mac, and click on the layer mask icon so you can see what that layer mask looks like and I missed the spot here so I'm going to fill it with black. Alt backspace to fill with foreground color, option backspace in the Mac and the foreground color is currently black so that's the color that it's going to fill with. If I hold Alt option again, click on the layer mask icon it brings the image back. So at this point the one thing that I probably would do is click on this chain icon here to remove the link between the layer and the layer mask. Now I can move the layer independently and just maybe adjust the clouds accordingly. Usually when you're making any sort of composition, you want to make sure that the ground plane and the sky are aligned. And where the ground plane and the sky meet is the horizon line. You can see the horizon line here and on the image in the bottom is somewhere here. So if those are sort of matching, then you can create a better composite. Usually when you see images don't match is because the two images have very different perspectives. So if I had the clouds down here somewhere, uh, they wouldn't look right just because the perspective is off. So you have to remember that even when working with skies, you have to um, keep the perspective in mind. So but the easiest way of knowing whether things are in perspective is by having two horizon lines that are pretty close to each other. And at least when it comes to compositing photographs, what I mean by horizon line is where the ground plane and the sky meet. And in images that contain water and, and the sky is very easy to see. It's right about there. So this is more or less how I would place these two images together. Any uh, questions before I move on, Andrew? No, just a lot of compliments, you know? People loving it. Awesome. Okay, cool. So now I'm gonna talk about density and feather in mass. So I have this solid here and it's black, but it could be whatever color. It really doesn't matter. I'm just going to be mostly talking about the layer mask. So I'm going to click on the layer mask and I'm just going to create a collection. It's just a circle and I'm going to fill it with black. So that's going to create a hole and we see white because that's our background color down here. If I disable that, you'll see the checkerboard indicating that it's uh, transparent pixels. Anyway. I'm going to click back on the mask and in the properties panel right up here um, I have some sliders that I'm going to be talking about but before I do that if you don't have the properties panel you can click on window properties and then you should see this panel here as I mentioned before you have to have the layer mask selected and these two sliders are two uh, sliders that I don't see a lot of people working with you can create non-destructive adjustments to your layer mask for example you can feather the layer mask Feathering means that the edges are blurred, so they're no longer sharp. And what I mean by non-destructive is that I can bring this back and it's sharp again. Density, you can think of density sort of like fading the layer mask. At 100%, you have your layer mask showing according to the luminance values you use in the layer mask. In this case, I use 100% black. Therefore, I have a hole and there's no transparency. You can see straight through. But if I bring the density down, notice what happens it starts turning gray so i'm 
bringing the opacity of that white down so it's now gray. Look at the layer mask icon. If I hold Alt, Option on the Mac, notice what the mask actually looks like now. It's now gray, it's no longer black. Therefore, there's some transparency and you can see straight through the layer below. If I bring the density down to zero, the layer mask is gone. Therefore, um, you can see the entire layer. If I hold Alt, Option on the Mac, click on the layer mask, you'll see that it's uh, the layer is now black as it was originally. If I start bringing the density back up, you'll notice the circle start appearing again. And at 100%, we have the layer mask as we had it before. And you can use a combination. You can use some feather and some density. So this really brings a lot of power to your layer mask um, since you don't really have to go in there and maybe use other techniques. I've seen people do things like, for example, if this was their layer mask, People go into filter, blur, Gaussian blur to try to blur that mask. And then maybe if it's too strong, they might do something like adjustments, levels, and then just bring bring the levels uh, levels down to sort of get that effect. The problem with doing this is that it's destructive. Um, so you can, you can make those same adjustments by using the density slider and the feather slider on all layer masks. Okay. So I'm still going to talk about layer masks, and now I'm going to talk about what you do when you're applying different layer masks to a layer to achieve a certain effect. Now, I'm not saying that this is the best effect in the world, but it just sort of makes it obvious that I'm trying to apply effects to the girl here. And I have three different adjustment layers that are applying this effect. Again, don't worry about the effect, worry more about the technique with layer masks. So, if I wanted to make an adjustment to the layer mask, because maybe I noticed that I missed her jeans, for example, the effect is not applied on her jeans. And if I look at the layer mask, I'll see that, yeah, the, the jeans are missing from, from that uh, selection. I will need to paint with white to apply that effect onto her jeans. Are. The problem is that I have three different adjustment layers using three different layer masks. So I'll have to go in there and paint all three adjustment layers just to get that effect. A better way of working is by using one layer mask. And what you could do is just put all those adjustments uh, into a group. And let me make sure she's not in the group. So I have a group that contains all the adjustments and just apply one layer mask to that group and just delete all the others. So now one layer mask controls all the adjustments. So if you need to make any changes, let me just increase the hardness there. So now I'm using one layer mask when I'm applying these three different effects. So that's a little quick tip there. You don't have to worry about adjusting multiple layer masks when using adjustment layers. Just put all the adjustment layers into a group and use one layer mask for all those adjustments. Now, what if you're trying to do something similar, but you have multiple layers and you want to have the flexibility of moving those layers around? If you have one layer mask, then that won't work because the layer mask is static. If you move one of the layers, the layer mask won't move with it. And if it does, it will destroy the effect. So one thing you can do is take advantage of blend modes in groups. If you notice when I click on a particular group, any group, the default blend mode is passed through. But uh, let me just enable this adjustment layers here. If, uh, notice that when I enable the uh, adjustment layers, they also affect the background. I don't want the adjustment layers to affect the background. I only want them to affect the two girls here. But if I create a layer mask, then I'm stuck in the position where those girls are at. And if I want to move them, I will have to essentially paint a whole new layer mask. So one of the things that you can do is click on the group that contains all the adjustments and the layers that you want those adjustments to affect, and then just change the blend mode from pass through to normal. Notice what happens to the background. The background does not get affected by the adjustment layers. So this is essentially the same thing as we did before, but this time we have the, we're not using a layer mask, we're using the blend mode, and we have the flexibility that we can move our layers around, and these adjustments are still being applied only to the items within this group.
if I drag one of these girls out of the group, notice that the adjustments are no longer applied. So setting the blend mode of a group to normal makes it so that the adjustments in that group are only applied to the layers in that group. If I bring it back to pass through, which is the default, you'll see that are applied to everything below, including layers not inside of that group. So, cool. Any questions, Andrew, before I keep going? A lot of people are okay. commenting that this to take in that they're going to have to uh, watch the recording. Okay, so this is a trick that I like using. I, uh, a lot of people have trouble creating shadows, and I think that one of the easiest ways to create a shadow is by using the exposure adjustment layer. So we have this ball here that I'm compositing into this scene, and I want to create a shadow. Well, like I said, one of the easiest ways is to use the exposure adjustment layer. But before I do that, I'm going to just simply create the shape with a selection of the ball here. There's the shape that my shadow will take. And then I'm going to go into the exposure adjustment layer. And then I'm going to bring the exposure down. And then I may need to play with the offset to sort of match the color of the shadow above there. And actually the exposure adjustment layer needs to be below the There it is. And I can move these sliders around until I match the shadows above. And remember the technique we learned earlier. If we click on the double click on the mask here, we get the density and feather. So maybe we can feather it just slightly so it's not so sharp. And that's one way in which you can easily create shadows in Photoshop and compositing. Just simply use the exposure adjustment. Layer. And uh, what's controlling the shape is a layer mask. You can come in there and paint things in or paint them away by using uh, black and white to paint them in. So that's just one little quick tip there on creating shadows with the exposure adjustment layer. Okay, so now we're going to talk about two blend modes that you have probably haven't seen, the behind blend mode and the clear, and they're not found on this uh, drop down the layers. They're only found on uh, tools that use painting, for example, the brush tool. We have behind and clear. And the behind blend mode allows you to paint on transparent pixels only. So if the pixels are opaque, you will not be able to paint uh, on them. So let me just disable the background here so you can see. Notice that this layer only contains the girl, no background. That's why you see the checkerboard. And with the behind blend mode, I'm gonna choose a different color now. You can only paint on transparent pixels. So you can actually, you cannot actually paint on her if you wanted to, if you had this blend mode. This is sort of the opposite. Uh, I'm gonna go back to normal. This is the opposite of locking the transparent pixels. If I click on this icon here, it locks the transparent pixels, so I can only paint on opaque pixels the opposite. So I can click on transparent ones only on opaque. So you can think of the uh, behind blend mode, and notice I can't select it right now because I have this uh, lock. You can think of the behind blend mode as the opposite of clicking on this transparency lock here. The other blend mode that you get with a brush tool is the clear blend mode, which allows you to delete pixels. It works pretty much the same way as the erasure tool, but that's what it does, clear. I don't use clear very much, but behind can be useful in certain situations that you only uh, want to paint on transparent pixels. Okay, so now I'm going to talk about eight special blend modes. All the blend modes are the same when it comes into bringing down the opacity and fill, you get the same result except for eight. And those eight are highlighted here in yellow. Color burn, linear burn, color dodge, linear dodge add, vivid light, linear light, hard mix, and difference. These blend modes will give you a different result if you bring down the fill. Uh, let me show you how that works. I'm gonna table that. I have a blank layer. I have a picture of this raccoon on this blank layer. I'm gonna paint it black this area here i'm gonna paint it white on this area here and by the way i'm pressing the x key on the keyboard to swap the foreground and background colors and i'm gonna paint with 50 percent gray here in the middle and if i go into the inner dodge add that's the result that i get if i go into 50 percent 
you can see what that is. And actually, um, let me go into the uh, into the history window, and I'm gonna create a snapshot. Actually, uh, sure of what's going on now, so we can remember. That'll help us remember. So we have snapshot one. That's opacity. I'm gonna change the opacity back to 100%, and now I'm gonna change the fill to 50%. Create a snapshot. Snapshot one. Snapshot two. You can see the difference between using fill and opacity. Now, this is not the greatest example. I'm going to show you um, one in a little bit, but you can see the difference of using uh, fill and opacity. Again, this is fill at 50% and opacity at 50%. So, um, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to talk about another technique, but I'm going to come back into that fill and opacity um, slider in a moment. I'm going to talk about the advanced blending options and before i do that i want to show you this shape here. this is just um these pixels here nothing special and i've applied a layer style i'm going to open up the layer style window here and i have some bevel i have a bevel in the boss gradient overlay uh, drop shadow and a few other uh layer styles that are creating this effect now we have the advanced blending options here and we have this checkbox here transparency shape layer if i click that the layer styles are going to be applied to the entire layer this checkbox is telling photoshop to only apply the effects to the opaque pixels and to ignore the transparency. now the reason i'm showing you this is just so i can show you this effect if you follow my tutorials, then you probably have seen this. I created a tutorial on how to create a coin using Photoshop. And I went through the steps of how to create this from scratch. And one of the steps that I show in that tutorial is what I'm about to show you now, which is how to add a, a specular highlight onto the coin. And if I paint with white, I can create a highlight. Obviously, that doesn't, that doesn't look too realistic. If I double click on the side of the layer to bring up the layer style window, I'm going to click on that same checkbox, Transparency Shapes Layer. For some reason, with those eight special blend modes that I spoke earlier, I spoke about earlier, if I uncheck this, the pixels blend differently when using any one of those blend modes. Nothing happened right now because I'm in the normal blend mode. But if I go into Linear Dodge Add, you'll see the difference. I'm gonna check it back. So that's default. It looks just the same as normal. So if I go into Linear Dodge Add, and then uncheck this checkbox here, Transparency Shape Layers, notice how the pixels blend. It looks hotter. It looks more like the specular highlight that we're going through. Again, with those eight blend modes that I spoke about earlier, unchecking this box will make the pixels blend differently. I'm not really sure why. I read up about it, and I haven't uh, gotten a response. And the reason I showed you that sun shape earlier was just to show you what that checkbox actually should do <clears throat> excuse me but for whatever reason it allows you to blend differently which is good because now we have control of uh of that specular highlight and we talked about opacity and fill earlier and if i bring down the opacity then it no longer looks like a specular highlight it just looks like a washed out white but if we start bringing the fill down notice that we still have that hot Effect, so it still looks like a highlight, uh, still looks like a specular highlight on the point, but now we can control the intensity by using the fill. So this is one of those uh, situations in where you can use fill as opposed to opacity to make an adjustment. So, and in case you didn't know, opacity and fill here are the same thing as if I was sliding the sliders here. Notice what happens when I slide uh, this fill opacity slider. 79%, 79% is here. If I slide this back down, 18%, 18% here. So it's the same thing if you use the fill slider here or here. But anyway, so this is how you can control. This is one way in which you can create um, specular highlights on metals using uh, just a white brushstroke. Okay, so now we're going to move into uh, the puppet warp. Um, a lot of people know the Puppet Work. Um, if you're an After Effects user, then you've known about Puppet Work forever. But I'll quickly show you what the Puppet Work can do. 
so we have the puppet warp and it creates this mesh and I can set these pins on the mesh to make adjustments. So now I can move her arm. And if I'm not happy with the pins that I set, I can delete them. So I can click on the pin, right click, and click on delete pin. And I can continue moving her arm. And her arm current in her hand is currently behind her head. So what how would you get her hand in front of her face? Well, you can use the pin depth right up here. I click on this icon here, it brings a hand in front of her face, which is in front of the mesh. If I click on this icon here, it moves it backward behind the mesh. So maybe this hand we want behind her head, and this hand we want in front of her face, like so. And maybe a little better adjustment. Maybe something like that. And actually, you know what? Maybe Photoshop. Something like that. I'm going to click on this check mark here. And now this hand is behind her head, and this one is in front of her face just by using the pin depth um, with the puppet work. Also, when kids are wondering if this uh, this arm doesn't look too realistic, uh, how would you go about fixing that? You can use the Liquify tool to continue making adjustments to, to the shape of her arm and try to make it a little bit more, more realistic. Obviously, I'm not going to take the time to do that, but you sort of get the idea of how this would work. And when you're done, that's the, uh, the effect that you get using the Puppet Warp, Liquify, and Pin Def to get the appropriate appropriate um, distortions on your image. Now I'm going to talk about Reconstruct using Liquify. And Reconstruct is a lot like using the Fade command, but in this case, using Liquify, which is pretty cool, I think. So I have this uh, photograph of this uh, man here. I'm going to go into Filter, Liquify, and I'm going to zoom in a little bit. You can see what I'm doing here. Maybe zoom out. Uh, actually, that's too close. Uh, should be right about there. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to use the float tool to make his back bigger. So maybe this guy works out a lot. So. And then he's got huge shoulders. You know, he works out at the gym and he only does his back and maybe you know, he like uh, leg day so he's... There you go. So uh, maybe this is maybe this is the effect that I was that I had in my head, but you know what? It's a little too much. I kind of want to bring it down just a little bit. A way of deconstructing the effect is um, by clicking on the reconstruct tool right here, and it's just simply a, uh, a slider, and I can slide it back. If I go to zero, it's what I had originally, and I can increase the amount to the appropriate um, scale that I want. So if I wanted him that big, I'll just leave it at 100, but maybe I can go halfway, 50%, or maybe just a little bit, maybe like 10%, make it a little more realistic. And then when you're done, you can simply press um, OK, and press OK again, and then that makes your uh, distortion on your image. And by the way, I didn't convert this into a smart object. I would recommend that when you're working with the Liquify tool, convert things into smart objects. So I'm going to right click on it, convert to smart object, then go into filter, Liquify, and make whatever adjustments you're going to make because this is a non-destructive effect. So you get the layer mask, you get to come back into Liquify by double clicking on the label and making further adjustments. You can also click on this icon here to bring in the blending options so you can do the opacity. Opacity works a little bit different than Deconstruct. Deconstruct actually pulls back on your effect. Opacity simply shows you what you had there before. So you, can, you get this ghosting effect. So opacity may not be the best option, but you can use a blend mode or, or something else. And again, with the blend mode, you will get that ghosting effect, but you have that option if you need it. I think it's the most useful thing about using a smart object uh, with Liquify is the layer mask that you get and also the ability to come back into Liquify if you need to and even reconstruct the, the effect, something that you don't get by applying the filter just on a regular layer. This is another technique that I like using when I'm creating selections, which is warping selections. So maybe I want to select this apple here. I want to start simple by clicking on the ellipse uh, selection tool. 
and I'm gonna make the selection very rough, something like that, but obviously the apple is not a perfect circle. Well, I can right click on the selection and click on transform selection. Then I can right click on it again and click on warp. Now I can click and drag on this handle to adjust the shape of the selection and try to match that apple a little bit better. Something like that. So it's a it's not a perfect circle now, it's an irregular shape. And I'm happy with that result. I'm gonna press enter. And then I can click on the layer mask icon. Now I have my apple selected. It's no longer a perfect circle. So you can use actually um let me go back. You can use um not only can you warp the selection, you can use scale, rotate, skew, the store perspective, and free transform to transform your selection. So they can be very useful for irregular shapes. Is what it, I'm going to talk about now. Let's say it's yeah. uh, one o'clock yeah. now. So um, it just seems to be like one question, really. But I just wanted to kind of pace you so you know it could be done by one thirty. So it's not you know, too much for you. Quite the intense, <laughs> intense amount of. I thought we were only going to one o'clock, but yeah, I can do. If, a few if more you got to go too, that's cool too. So far, there's just one question. Really. B Sparkle asks, "How do we put something onto a transparent layer?" So let's show how to do that. How to how to put something on a transparent layer? Um, I'm not exactly sure what they mean. I mean, right, uh, create a new empty I'm layer and then layer. just drag something onto it. Let me quickly just show that, and then we'll move on. So then we have this guy here, and I'm just gonna make a quick selection out of him. And let's just say that I want to drag that out. I have the move tool selected. I can click and drag that, hover over on the tab, and then release it on the window that I'm working with. That's, or I mean, another way of doing it would be to create a blank layer, have the selection, edit, copy, come back to the file I'm working with, edit, paste. So that's that's two ways. Okay, so what I'm going to do now is just look for a file that would be good to work on. We can use this one here. And I'm actually going to rasterize the layer. Actually, I don't need to do that. I can create a new layer. And you know what? I will rasterize this because it's probably a more likely workflow. So I'm going to talk about using the blur, sharpen, and uh, smudge tool non destructively. So a lot of times you have an image and you want to come and Maybe you want to smudge it, and maybe you want to um, sharpen it in some areas, and maybe you want to blur it in other areas. Now, the problem with doing that is that you destroy the file that you're working with. But what you can do is actually create a blank layer. And when you're working with these tools, make sure that sample all layers is checked here in the options panel. So I'm going to go ahead and blur this part, and then like the sharpen tool, sample of layers, make sure that's checked. And paint on that area, and then I'm gonna smudge the face again. And obviously, this really it's not a thing you probably would do, but again, it's gonna show the, the tip that I'm playing. If I disable the woman layer, you'll see what Photoshop did. Photoshop created those adjustments in a new layer, so you're not destroying the original layer. And also as a side tip, whenever you click on a tool, make sure that you look at the options panel because there's so many um, valuable options that you have up here with all the different tools. Notice that when you click on a tool, all these tools have different options. So keep that in mind. Also as a side note, um, if you've been working on Photoshop for a while and a tool is no longer working the way you thought it should work or, or there's a problem, you can always go back into the default settings. So you can click on this icon here on the drop down uh, arrow here and then go into the flyout menu and choose reset tool which will reset the tool that you're working on or you can click on reset all tools and it's going to reset all the tools to the default settings and you can press ok so now all the tools have the default settings so again if, if one if you're working with the tool and it's just giving you problems try resetting it to the default settings and maybe that'll bring it back but again usually any problems that you have with the tool is because the, uh, you don't have the right option set in the options bar. So always look up here for, for clues if something is not working the way it should. And uh, another trick that I want to show is how to use the curves adjustment layer or how to redo a curves adjustment that you apply to an image. So maybe you're working with an image, you go into image, adjustment, 
curves and you apply an adjustment. There it is. And I know you can save it, but maybe you forget to save it and you apply it and you want to go back and, and use that same adjustment. Well, you can't. If you go into image, adjustment, curves, that adjustment is no longer there. But if you hold alt as you go into image, adjustment, curves, and that's option on the back, curves, then you bring the last adjustment that you made. So remember using that alt key um, for a lot of different things, but one of those things is helping Photoshop remember what the last curves that you use was. Unfortunately, that doesn't work if you're using an adjustment. It only works if you go into the adjustment menu curves right up here. Uh, Jesus, there's a, I'm not sure what they're talking about density, but there's a question from JJ. How does density and opacity both different from each other? I'm wondering if you're talking about opacity and fill. I don't know what you mean by that. They're probably talking about the um, mask. So let me find the file here with a mask. Um, that'll help me illustrate this point. Okay. So I think the person used the word opacity. Opacity controls the the layer opacity, meaning how transparent the layer is. Notice that I'm bringing the opacity down. That's the layer. Density only talks about the mask. See how have this mask here that means the mask is uh not as strong so it's gonna bring the original background so density in, in in so density controls how how much of the mask is visible at 100 percent, whatever we have in the mask is going to show at zero the mask is not going to show it pretend that zero is removing the mask 100 percent is what's on the mask and anything in between will be different levels of opacity between the areas that are hidden and the visible areas. So you can sort of see the original background as we bring down density. So that's the difference. Density controls the mask and opacity controls the entire layer, including the mask. So if I bring the density down to zero, um, you'll see that I, I'm still um, removing that background. So opacity controls layer and mask and density only mask. Okay, so um, I, I have just a few more things that I want to show, and um, let me see. Look at the time. Okay, I think we have enough. Oh, time. Uh, yeah. So we could do a contest too at gonna... the end, right? Yeah, um, yeah, we are. Um, uh, now that since you brought it up, I guess I'll mention it now. I have a Photoshop for beginners training course. It's called Photoshop Fundamentals. You can check it out on my website if you like. And I'm going to be giving away one free nice. uh, copy for somebody here today. The things that I'm going to talk about now are regarding the text tool. So some people may not know that you can create a text box and you can type whatever you like in that text box. A lot of times you may be working on projects. This is probably more likely for designers and you have to design something, but you don't have the copy from your client yet, but you've got to get something on, on screen.